Pakistan. Many nations have already heard threats from Russian officials and state propagandists. I am grateful to all the diligent and civilized states who share our position and help defend the international legal order. This meeting of the uh, UN Security Council convened is convened after the Russian missile strike in Kremenchuk. But in fact, the meeting of the UN Security Council uh, may not be adjourned at all. It can go on round the clock, day after day, for us to have time to discuss every terrorist act of the Russian state. The UN Charter gives all the levers to influence any violator of the rules of the organization, any aggressor, any terrorist state. And I urge you to take advantage of these levers. It is imperative to deprive the Russian delegation of the opportunity to manipulate the UN. It is imperative to make it impossible for Russia to stay in the UN Security Council until its terrorism continues. It is imperative to establish a tribunal for investigating everything that the Russian military have done against Ukrainians, and it is imperative to uh, give the legal definition of the notion state terrorism at the UN level. All Russian action must receive legal assessment and global sanctions for the fact that Russia is destructing international legal order. Thank you for your attention. I wish to say just one more thing. Various countries worldwide can have uh, different uh, attitudes to wars uh, worldwide, but they similarly commemorate the victims, not only the military, but uh, every person, every child who is dying, unfortunately, due to this tragedy, the tragedy of war. That is the usual thing. Usually treat with respect and sympathy those who have been unfairly killed. And only the killers do not commemorate those whom they have killed. And I ask you now, I will be very much grateful if you could commemorate all the Ukrainians who have been killed in this war, all the adults, all, the, all of our children, tens of thousands of people, and I ask you to commemorate them with a, with a minute of silence. Thank you very much indeed. It is a great honor for us. Thank you for support. Thank you very much indeed. I thank His Excellency Mr. Zelensky for his statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as a representative of Albania. Thank you, USGD Carlo, for this update. Again, a troubling one on this issue. Colleagues, a senseless war of aggression that could and must have been avoided has entered its fifth month. 125 days of outspread destruction, mounting civilian casualties and continued pain inflicted on millions of people across Ukraine. Other millions across the world find themselves victims as collateral damage of a war that has nothing to do with them, that is weaponizing everything, energy, trade, communication, including primarily food. Colleagues, let's remind ourselves, on 29th March, five weeks after the start of its war of choice in Ukraine, Russia announced its withdrawal of forces from the Kyiv area. The reason provided then was that it was a goodwill gesture to favor negotiations between the parties. The truth proved very different. The attempt to take in Kyiv failed spectacularly. 
Negotiations went nowhere. War intensified instead. Russia continues its massive assault on Ukraine, threatening Europe, running against every human effort invested since World War II to build global peace through the international rule of law. As war has shifted ferociously to the east, life returned to some sort of normalcy in Kiev until missiles starting again falling from the sky with an unmistaken message. Russia can hit you at will, anywhere, anytime, just because it can. Last Sunday, nearly 1,000 people found themselves under a Russian airstrike which hit a shopping mall in the city of Kremenchuk in central Ukraine. Reportedly, tens of people lost their lives and several dozens were injured. What possible justification can be provided to missiles thrown over a commercial center in the very heart of an urban area? What can possibly explain such blatant indiscriminate brutality against civilians. We have heard so many times, Russia has continued to deny struggling civilians, but overwhelming evidence like this one proves again and again the contrary. Have we forgotten that Kiev was deliberately targeted last April as the UN Secretary General was visiting the city? Reports speak now of deliberate attacks in protesting to the G7 meeting. If it were so, why should civilians, including children, pay the price of such despicable symbolism? Indiscriminate attacks on civilian infrastructure and innocent civilian constitute war crimes. We all know it. Those who decide to attack shopping centers, shelters, schools, hospitals, kindergarten, apartment buildings are well aware of possible civilian casualties. They know they are committing war crimes when their responsibility is to protect civilians. They must pay for these actions. Colleagues, this aggression is not limited to Ukraine only. Zealous commentators of the state propaganda, but also senior Kremlin officials, fill the air with worst case scenario of deploying weapons of mass destruction, including, as we have heard more than once, nuclear cyber rattling. We notice a dramatic increase of cyber warfare and advanced disinformation attacks. Further, the current food insecurity crisis continues to spread around the world. Global food prices are now at an all-time high. This is the parallel war that Russia is waging against the world. It has transformed the war in Ukraine from a local act of aggression to an acute international challenge. We know that millions of tons of grain are piled in Ukraine. Out of it, 8 million tons are said to be in the occupied areas of Russia, and Russia is reportedly stealing it from Ukraine. A meticulous and professional investigation from the BBC shows how this is carried out in Donbas, and not only for the grain, but also for other Ukrainian assets. Russia has already occupied 20% of the Ukrainian territory, but its appetite has increased. Colleagues, this war is paralyzing Ukraine. It is destroying its industry, its roads and schools and its health system along the way. It is killing civilians. It is punishing its youth and is destroying the fabric of a society. But also it is testing the resolve of all those who truly believe in the rules international order, in rules-based international order, in the respect of the UN Charter. Therefore, this is no time to stay aside. International support for Ukraine and its people is a moral and solidarity issue. It is to choose to stand on the right side, that of the law, of rights, of life, of dignity. One day this war will be over, but the way it will end matters to all of us. If we want to preserve the rule of law, we must make sure that everyone knows the cost of aggression against another country. We welcome the recent commitments of G7 for a new package of coordinated actions aimed at increasing pressure on Russia over its war in Ukraine. We also welcome the latest decision of the European Union. 
Colleagues, let me end with this. This war must stop with full and immediate withdrawal of the Russian forces and military equipment from the territory, from the entire territory of Ukraine. The sooner, the better for all Ukraine, for Russia, and the entire world. Thank you. I resume my function as President of the Council. I now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Under Secretary General DiCarlo, for your compelling, if ultimately heartbreaking, briefing. I thank President Zelensky for addressing the Council again today. We were honored by his presence here, but I think we're all horrified by the circumstances under which we meet. And we express our deepest condolences to him and the people of the Ukraine for the horrors they continue to suffer on a daily basis, including the senseless attack by Putin's forces that destroyed the shopping center in Kremenchuk. America stands, as always, united with Ukraine. It would already be an outrage if yesterday's attack was a horrific exception, but it is not even that. The attack fits into a cruel pattern, one where the Russian military kills civilians and destroys civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. The Kremlin has demonstrated time and time again that it is trying to subjugate Ukraine, its sovereignty, its people, its spirit. Putin keeps trying to intimidate and divide Ukraine's partners. We have shown and will continue to show that our support for Ukraine is resolute. I expect the representative from the Russian Federation in a moment to try to obfuscate, to avoid responsibility and blame others for this tragedy. But no one here will be fooled. We all see the grim reality for what it is. And the reality is that Russia's war of choice has led directly to the destruction of crowded malls, grocery stores, theaters, hospitals, and schools, and the innocent civilians inside them. Make no mistake, there is ample publicly available evidence that Russia, and Russia alone, is responsible for these attacks. And make no mistake, deliberate and indiscriminate attacks on civilians and civilian objects constitute war crimes. The United States has previously assessed that members of Russia's armed forces have committed war crimes in Ukraine. I repeat, to be clear, war crimes. The evidence is mounting and it cannot be ignored. We have seen too many credible reports of the bombing of schools and hospitals, like the maternity hospital in Mariupol, the killing of aid workers, the targeting of a civilians attempting to flee for their lives, or standing in line for water, as the president just reminded us. We've seen forced relocation of thousands of Ukrainian civilians and the brutal execution-style murder of those going about their daily business in Bucha. We call upon all fellow council members, including those who are failing to condemn what is in front of them, to speak the full truth we all have a responsibility to make clear the moral culpability that Russia holds in this war of choice. There's no such thing as both sides when it comes to these recent attacks. The international community must hold those who perpetrated and ordered these crimes to account. Justice must be served. Justice must come for Russia's military and political leadership, as well as for its military rank and file who commit war crimes or other atrocities. The United States supports all international investigations into these crimes, including those being conducted by the ICC, the UN, and the OSCE. We have welcomed the International Criminal Court's decision to open an investigation into atrocity crimes committed in Ukraine. And with our EU colleagues, we are supporting the Ukrainian national authorities, specifically the Office of the Prosecutor General, as these authorities investigate and prepare to prosecute war crimes cases. At the same time, the world has come together to say enough is enough. Just yesterday, leaders of G7 countries reaffirmed our solidarity and unwaving commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty. 
Our leaders made clear that we will help Ukraine defend itself and choose its own future free from external pressure or influence. And the United States and the world will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. We will not rest until Russia ends this cruel and senseless war. How many more attacks will there be? But for those on this council who continue to tap dance around Russia's culpability, demonstrate that they care more about the protection of civilians than protecting their own interests, and start speaking of the steps Russia needs to take to resolve the crisis that it started. Colleagues, Russia started this war. Russia is the one committing atrocities against civilians. And only Russia can end this war by withdrawing its forces from Ukraine and reaching a political settlement with Ukraine's democratically elected government. Let us all continue to do everything in our power to see that day soon. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States for their statement. I would like to give the floor to the representative of France. Monsieur le Président, President, je remercie Madame Di Carlo like pour sa présentation. Je salue la participation du président Zelensky et l'assure de la pleine solidarité de la France envers l'Ukraine. La France condamne avec la plus grande fermeté la frappe russe hier contre un centre commercial dans la ville de Kremenchuk qui a fait, selon un bilan provisoire, au moins une dizaine de victimes. Cette attaque injustifiable, mais que la dernière en date d'une longue série. Ces derniers jours, L'armée russe a pilonné délibérément le territoire ukrainien, prenant pour cible des zones résidentielles et des infrastructures civiles, loin des zones de combat. Le bilan est lourd. À Kharkiv, à Lysychansk et dans le centre-ville de Kiev, les missiles russes ont fait plusieurs morts et des dizaines de blessés. Depuis le début de cette guerre, la Russie a fait le choix de prendre pour cible les populations, tuant des enfants, des personnels humanitaires, des journalistes. Elle continue à détruire sans relâche des infrastructures civiles. Il s'agit là d'une tactique de guerre visant à terroriser et affaiblir le moral du peuple ukrainien. Ce faisant, la Russie continue de violer les principes les plus élémentaires du droit international humanitaire après avoir piétiné la Charte des Nations Unies et ses principes fondateurs, comme l'a clairement énoncé la Cour internationale de justice le 16 mars dernier. Monsieur le Président, je le dis avec fermeté, les criminels de guerre seront traduits en justice. La France continuera à appuyer le travail des juridictions et mécanismes internationaux, régionaux et nationaux pour s'assurer que les faits commis en Ukraine, dont certains pourraient constituer des crimes de guerre et des crimes contre l'humanité, ne resteront pas impunis. La France renouvelle son appel à coopérer avec la Cour pénale internationale ainsi qu'avec les mécanismes d'enquête. Elle maintiendra la pression pour contraindre les autorités russes à mettre fin à cette guerre. Le monde entier est affecté par ce conflit. Il risque de faire basculer un cinquième de la population mondiale dans la pauvreté et l'insécurité alimentaire. Et la Russie en porte l'entière responsabilité. Il est inacceptable qu'elle utilise la faim comme un levier politique. Je tiens à le rappeler, les sanctions adoptées à son encontre, contrairement à ce qui se raconte, ne vise ni les céréales, ni les biens agricoles, ni les engrais. La Russie doit lever le blocus des ports ukrainiens en mer Noire afin de permettre l'exportation des denrées alimentaires. La France soutient pleinement les efforts déployés par le secrétaire général à cet égard. Monsieur le Président, la France appelle la Russie à respecter ses engagements internationaux, à cesser les hostilités, à retirer ses forces armées d'Ukraine et à mettre un terme à cette guerre injustifiable et dévastatrice. L'accès humanitaire 
doit être garanti, en particulier dans les régions les plus touchées par les combats. Face aux défis historiques que représente le retour de la guerre en Europe, l'Union européenne a décidé d'octroyer à l'Ukraine le statut de candidat à l'adhésion, car aujourd'hui, le peuple ukrainien se bat pour défendre nos valeurs et celles promues par la Charte des Nations Unies. La France, qui a déjà mobilisé 2 milliards de dollars pour le soutien économique et humanitaire, continuera de se tenir résolument aux côtés des Ukrainiens, dont je veux ici à nouveau saluer le courage. Je vous remercie. Je remercie le représentant de la I thank France the pour sa of France for his statement. And I give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank the Albanian presidency for convening this urgent Security Council, Security Council meeting on the conflict in Ukraine. And I thank Under Secretary Rosemary De Carlo for her briefing. Brazil received with deep concern recent news of air strikes on or near densely populated areas in Ukrainian cities, of which the commercial center of Kremenchuk yesterday is the most dramatic example. We deeply regret the loss of human life and the destruction of urban and industrial infrastructure, which will be undoubtedly have serious consequences for the already dire humanitarian situation in the country. Attacks against civilian objects, especially in densely populated areas, encourage a perverse logic of retaliation. We urge the parties to allow an impartial investigation into these incidents and to refrain from actions that could result in increased civilian casualties. Brazil reiterates its call for parties to respect their obligations under the UN Charter and international humanitarian law, including observing the principles of distinction and proportionality. This comprises the protection of civilians in all circumstances, entailing the exercise of restraint by military forces and the establishment of mechanisms for evacuating areas directly impacted by operations. We encourage parties to engage in constructive dialogue to achieve this common goal. Mr. President, four months after the start of the conflict, it should be clear that there is no alternative to a political solution. It is unreasonable for military operations should be prolonged with no prospect for an end to the immense human suffering imposed on civilian populations. We renew our appeal for an, for an immediate cessation of hostilities and the establishment of peace negotiations without delay or preconditions. This Council is responsible for creating conditions for dialogue. We should redouble efforts to seek solutions that favor peace negotiations and minimize the impacts of the conflict, both in Ukraine and in, and in other affected regions. And I thank you. I thank the representative of Brazil for their statement, and I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President. And I join others in thanking USG De Carlo for her briefing. And while we welcome President Zelensky's participation, again, we deeply regret the circumstances that brought him here today. President, just over four months since the start of its illegal invasion, Russia's war against Ukraine continues. Russia continues to pummel Ukraine's eastern Donbass region in an effort to seize full control. And over the weekend, Russia launched an intense barrage of cruise missile attacks at targets across Ukraine, including hitting a shopping centre in Kremenchuk with over 1,000 people inside. We heard from President Zelensky 
the roll call of the recent dead and extend our condolences to their families and their friends. When the world calls for peace, for dialogue and adherence to international law, Russia answers with escalation, with missiles and targeting civilians. More attacks, more destruction, more death, and as I'm sure we will hear again today, more war propaganda, more lies, more disinformation. Nor can we ignore the prominent role of Belarus in acting as a direct staging post for the attacks over the weekend and yesterday. We praise the extraordinary bravery and resolve of the Ukrainian people in the face of this brutal assault on its sovereignty and territorial integrity and its very existence as a country. Ukraine is entitled to defend itself as any of us would if our cities, towns and villages were subject to repeated relentless missile strikes by a foreign army focused on wiping out our existence. So we will continue to support Ukraine, to exercise this right of self-defense and to re-secure its privileges and rights under the UN Charter. We yet again reiterate the calls of the international community for Russia to end its illegal invasion withdraw outside Ukraine's internationally recognised borders and enter into dialogue and negotiation. At a time when we are facing the existential threats of climate change and food insecurity following a global pandemic, Russia must end its illegal war and its blockade of Ukraine's ports. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for their statement and I give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I would like to thank the Under Secretary General for her briefing, a briefing which highlights yet again the brutality of this unlawful war. For four months, Mr. President, we have called for an end to the unjustified and unjustifiable war being waged against Ukraine. Yet, as each day passes, reports of violations of human rights and international humanitarian law by Russia grow. Civilians in Ukraine continue to pay the highest price. On Monday, Russian forces attacked a shopping mall in Kremenchuk, full of civilians going about their ordinary lives. This appears to have been a clear attack against civilians and civilian infrastructure in flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. The consequences of this attack, reported by credible media sources, is civilians killed. Mr. President, we have heard today how civilians continue to bear the brunt of Russia's unconscionable war. All allegations of violations of international human rights and humanitarian law must be investigated and those responsible held to account. Parties to conflict must comply with international humanitarian law, including the obligation to distinguish between civilians and combatants and to attack only military object objectives. The prohibitions against indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks and the obligation to take all feasible precautions in attack. Mr. President, compliance is not optional. Yesterday, yesterday's Russian strike on Kremenchuk is not the first on Ukraine's towns and cities, we know. We deplore Russia's use of explosive weapons, including prohibited cluster munitions in populated areas without regard for civilians. The UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine 
has recorded over 10,000 civilian casualties, most of which have been caused by the use of explosive weapons. We condemn indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks in all circumstances. We are committed to ensuring accountability for the atrocious crimes taking place in Ukraine and recognise the important role of the ongoing investigation of the International Criminal Court in helping to pursue this. We must not accept impunity for those inflicting such horrors, not in Ukraine, not anywhere in the world. We once again call on the Russian Federation to comply with its obligations under international law. There must be full, safe and unhindered humanitarian access for humanitarian personnel to reach civilians, including those who choose to remain in Ukraine and those who are un unable to depart, including the elderly. They are not combatants and must be protected in accordance with international humanitarian law. The Russian Federation must allow those seeking to leave their towns and cities in Ukraine to do so safely to destinations of their own choosing. President, Russia can end its aggression if it chooses, but even while it chooses to execute an, Ill an illegal war, it still has obligations under international law and it must comply with those obligations. We call again on the Russian Federation to end its war and to withdraw all forces unconditionally from the entirety of the sovereign territory of Ukraine. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of Ireland for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. I also thank Under Secretary General, Madam Rosemary De Carlo, for her briefing, as well as His Excellency President Zelensky for his address. Kenya stands in solidarity with the people of Ukraine who are suffering the failure of the multilateral system to bring an end to a war that continues unabated in disregard of the raison d'etre of the United Nations to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. A war whose catastrophic impact in Ukraine and across the world is worsening by the day. We are gravely concerned by the latest developments especially in Mikolaev, Yoniv, Zotoma, Lviv, Odessa, and Chakasi regions, as well as in Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Kremenchuk cities. The reported intensified airstrikes and missile shelling in these regions and cities are destroying civilian objects with a growing toll on civilian casualties. These indiscriminate acts constitute a violation of the UN Charter, international law, and international humanitarian law. Kenya condemns the disproportionate use of force and the targeting of civilians and objects indispensable to the survival of civilian populations including residential homes, health facilities, shelters, shopping malls, as well as power and water infrastructure. We are concerned that the continued destruction of civilian infrastructure is significantly impeding Ukraine's ability to engage in international trade, including the export of key commodities, particularly agricultural products and farm inputs such as fertilizer. In addition, the blockade of Ukraine's access to the Black Sea has disrupted the global food supply chain. And this is worsening food insecurity, especially in conflict situations and fragile economies in the global south. With the surging inflation rates and the spike in food and fuel prices globally, this armed conflict is undermining efforts to build back from the COVID-19 pandemic. We commend the Secretary General for his efforts, including the establishment of the Global Crisis Response Group on Food, 
energy and finance. This is a good first step towards the establishment of instruments that can cushion the most vulnerable from the effects of the conflict. Of critical importance, Mr. President, is the imperative to immediately stop further infliction of suffering on civilians, especially the vulnerable groups, including women, children, and the elderly. We therefore urge the parties to adhere to international humanitarian law, including the four 1949 Geneva Conventions and its first additional protocol of 1977, as well as ensure the protection of civilian population and detainees. We call on them to shift their focus to an immediate cessation of the war, refrain from any actions that may further escalate the situation, and prioritize the use of diplomatic tools to resolve the conflict. The cessation should set the foundation for a lasting peace settlement that respects the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of Ukraine. It should also lead to the design of a European security order that offers lasting security and not a generation of new wars in Europe or elsewhere. Finally, I reaffirm Kenya's respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, let me thank USG Rosemary Di Carlo for her briefing to the Council on the prevailing situation in Ukraine and the rising humanitarian suffering occasioned by the war. I also acknowledge the virtual participation of the President of Ukraine, His Excellency, Mr. Volodymyr Zelensky. My delegation reaffirms its unwavering support for the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Ghana is gravely concerned by the reports of the intensification of military bombardments in several regions across Ukraine over the past couple of days, and for which the ordinary people, especially women and children, are having to pay the highest price. We remain concerned that residential areas continue to be the target of missile launches and bombardments, and regret that such places have increasingly become the arena for combat. In this context, we call for an independent, impartial, and transparent investigation into the Kremonchuk Mall attack, which occurred yesterday and resulted in several casualties. Over the last four months, the war has continued unabated under conditions that have precipitated considerable human suffering and despair. While the present situation casts a grim outlook for peace, as purveyors of global peace and security, we cannot and must not lose hope of finding peace in the interest of the conflicting parties and the wider international community. With each passing day, the urgency to find a peaceful and durable solution to the conflict grows. The snowballing effect of the collateral economic impact on the rest of the international community, especially developing countries, which already are burdened by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and other pressing global challenges, could soon go beyond the reach of easy resolution. It is therefore our plea that ongoing diplomatic efforts should be given an opportunity for the cause of peace and the abatement of this needless war on the basis of a commitment to genuine and unconditional dialogue. We welcome the positive results that follow the Secretary General's visit to Kyiv and Moscow during the month of April, which demonstrate for us the utility of the United Nations in such delicate circumstances. We encourage the parties to accept the good offices of the Secretary General in repairing the broken trust occasioned by the war against Ukraine in order to move forward stored negotiations. We call for an immediate cessation of military engagements in areas populated by civilians and urge the urgent creation of demilitarized humanitarian corridors in all besieged areas in compliance with the precepts of international law and international humanitarian law. We note the obligation of the conflicting parties to proactively protect civilians and civilian infrastructure from harm. Similarly, aid and humanitarian workers 
must be afforded equal treatment of protection. In concluding, we urge maximum restraint and encourage rhetoric that is facilitative of a peaceful process. Finally, we reiterate our call to the members of this council to harness all efforts in bringing an end to this war and restoring peace and stability to Ukraine. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ghana for their statement, and I give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Gracias, President. Thank you, President. Agradezco a la subsecretaria Di Carlo por su General Di Carlo presentación for her briefing. y al presidente Zelensky, quien Zelensky, se ha dirigido nuevamente a este consejo el día de hoy. El pasado 24 de junio se cumplieron cuatro meses del inicio de esta guerra. Lamentablemente, de nueva cuenta, se ha registrado un incremento en los ataques en contra de la infraestructura civil y en zonas muy pobladas en diversas regiones de Ucrania, incluida aquí y de manera señalada en Luhansk y Donetsk. Condenamos el ataque de ayer a un centro we condemn yesterday's attack on a shopping center in Kremlinchuk, en se encontraba un numeroso grupo de a shopping center with many civilians inside it. Aún no se tiene el saldo final, we do not know pero hasta ahora, al menos 18 muertos y decenas the final number de of deaths yet, but there are at least lamentable. 18 deaths and dozens un ataque of injured, de esta naturaleza which is deplorable. es contrario An al derecho internacional y al derecho internacional, internacional humanitario. And international humanitarian. Respaldamos el llamado no. del coordinador humanitario We para Ucrania the en el sentido de iniciar Ukraine sin for dilación una investigación independent investigation independiente begin sobre estos into hechos. These facts. De igual forma, reiteramos Likewise, nuestro apoyo al fiscal de la Corte Penal Internacional en sus investigaciones sobre posibles crímenes de guerra cometidos committed en Ucrania. In Ukraine. Resultan asimismo injustificables los bombardeos en áreas residenciales en múltiples poblaciones in numerous del Donbass, in the Donbass que han destruido infraestructura crítica de comunicaciones y servicios. Infrastructure and services. Han afectado gravemente la provisión de servicios esenciales de salud, services, así como el acceso and a varias ciudades to various cities de la región. Of the region. Hacemos un llamado urgente we call para que se permita el acceso seguro e irrestricto a todo el personal to que presta humanitarian personnel. Una de las principales premisas del derecho internacional humanitario humanitarian es el principio de distinción, toda vez que su objetivo final And one of its es evitar siempre que sea posible el sufrimiento civilian suffering, o en su caso, reducir al máximo el daño and to reduce damage causar. to a minimum. No respetar este principio Failing to respect this principle is a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. Lo mismo podemos decir que ocurre the same con el uso de municiones en racimos. Son armas munitions. que están prohibidas These are por el derecho are prohibited by international humanitarian Señor law. Presidente, Preocupa sobremanera la proliferación de armas en la región. Se trata de un factor de volatilidad adicional por su creciente disponibilidad en manos de población civil propicia la continuación de los conflictos. Excelencias. Convengamos en que urge la mediación y el diálogo que lleven a un cese al fuego total. Esa y no otra this, debiera ser this la prioridad de este Consejo. Pero en tanto esto es posible, resulta happens, prioritario incrementar las pausas humanitarias que garanticen pauses, la evacuación segura y voluntaria de la población y encontrar mecanismos para movilizar to to fertilizantes y otros grain, insumos básicos que se encuentran confinados por la guerra en Ucrania y que aumentan las precarias condiciones de insuficiencia alimentaria en muchas otras regiones del mundo. Regions of the world. Urge parar la guerra. Gracias, Presidente. Gracias, Presidente. 
and I give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. Thank you, Mr. President. Before I begin my statement, I would like to say the following. We are greatly concerned by the line taken by the Albanian presidency regarding the participation of President Zelensky in today's meeting. No consultations were held with all the members of the Council on this matter. Delegations were essentially presented with a fait accompli at the last possible moment. This violates existing practice and the traditions of the work of the Security Council. President Zelensky was already provided with an opportunity to address the Council once as a matter of exception and as the then British presidency assured without creating a presidency. We do not see any basis to keep propagating such exceptions. We have all together repeatedly reaffirmed the understanding that representatives of states who wish to speak in the Council must be physically present in the chamber. The UN Security Council should not be turned into a platform for a remote PR campaign for President Zelensky in order to get more weapons from participants of the NATO summit. This undermines the authority of the Council as a body responsible for collective decisions on the maintenance of international peace and security. The Ukrainian party, at the instigation of our Western colleagues, is attempting to undermine this authority and turn the members of the Council into an audience for acting performances. I wish to draw attention to the fact that just a week ago, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Central African Republic was refused the opportunity to speak to the Council. The Council should not demonstrate double standards in order to serve the Ukrainian party and its Western backers, discriminating against African states while they do so. There should not be any exceptions for anyone. Mr. President, from the very beginning of the special military operation in Ukraine, which was aimed at ending the eight-year war of the Kiev regime against the civilian population of eastern Ukraine, we were faced with the fact that the true situation on the front line was not the main concern of Ukrainian authorities. They were much more concerned about another front, the information front, which they, together with their Western PR uh, propagandists, uh, collaborators, took up with special zeal. If someone were to try counting all the Ukrainian fakes that have been disseminated thus far, there would easily be enough for a weighty tome or even a collected body of works. Just take the beautiful but absolutely false legend about the Russian ship to which the brave defenders of Snake Island allegedly refused to surrender and for which they paid with their lives. They were awarded the title of Heroes of Ukraine posthumously for this by President Zelensky. Of course, it later turned out that the entire Ukrainian garrison of the island was alive and well and had safely surrendered to the Russian army. But the legend was not rewritten and Ukraine still proudly issues stamps with this patriotic story. How about the famous ace pilot, the Phantom of Kiev, who allegedly terrorized the Russian Air Force and shot down dozens of Russian aircraft? No matter that his air exploits were illustrated with fragments from computer games or old internet videos. Later on, however, even Western journalists reluctantly had to admit that this was a fabrication. Yet some Ukrainian propagandists continue to exploit this legend to this day. Internet videos are a separate issue altogether. At the initial stages of the special military operations, even the British BBC was horrified by the number of Ukrainian video fakes. But then, like other Western media, it became to take a more relaxed approach and even to publish its own, passing off homes in Donetsk destroyed by Ukrainian shelling 
Украинцы и их западные кураторы быстро поняли, что то, что происходит на земле, наш цифровой век вообще не важно. Важно то, что и как показывают западные СМИ. Воспользовавшись добровольным отходом российских войск из Киевской киевские западные пропагандисты явили миру чудовищную по масштабу и чудовищную уже по исполнению провокацию Буча. Несмотря на вопиющие нестыковки, ее по-прежнему многие на, Запад, на Западе верят, как мы слышали сегодня. А киевские власти используют Место ее осуществления в качестве пункта обязательной программы для зарубежных Благо, находится оно рядом с Киевом. Своего рода зловещий маркетинг, который очень удобно использовать для того, чтобы выбивать поставки вооружений Буча стала поворотным моментом поставки западных вооружений, что и было целью украинских властей. Они это сами открыто признавали. Как заявил Минендел Украины Кулеба в интервью телеканалу BBC 4 апреля, цитирую, «Бойня Буча должна устранить любые колебания и нежелания Запада обеспечивать Украину всем необходимым оружием». Конец цитаты. Войдя во вкус, и тогда появился обстрел вокзала в Краматорске, который должен был заключить в сознании мировой общественности убежденность российской армии. Но он был сделан так топорно и настолько неубедительно, что о нем теперь предпочитают даже не вспоминать. Столь очевидно, причастность к этому преступлению вооруженных сил Украины. И тогда, в духе лучших гибельских традиций, начал внедряться западное сознание образ русского солдата, варвара, насильника и мародера. Ровно так, как это делали фашисты на последнем этапе Второй мировой войны. И начали тогда наши солдаты в изложении украинских пропагандистов мародерствовать, насильничать и пугать своей невиданной жестокостью. Все мы помним, как сидящий сейчас с нами представитель киевского режима на голубом глазу рассказывает, как наши солдаты воруют стиральные машины и даже унитазы, потому что дома у них такой чудо техники отродясь не было. Сегодня его последователи модифицировали эту нелепую байку до того, что наши солдаты воруют электрочайники, но забывают взять подставки под них, так как не знают, как они пользуются. Логично вписывается в эту логику и ложь о воровстве украинского зерна, которую мы также услышали сегодня. И во все это многие на Западе верят, и верных украинцев жалели, а россиян люто ненавидели. И факты проверять не спешили, и исправно поставляли Киеву вожделенное оружие. Но с какого-то момента пошло у украинских пропагандистов все наперекосяк. Стали множиться в соцсетях свидетельства тех, кто обвинял именно украинских солдат и националистов в жестокости и военных преступлений. В мародерствах, пытках, изнасилованиях, сознательных обстрелах жилых кварталов, размещении в них тяжелых вооружений и использовании мирных жителей в качестве живого счета. И было таких свидетельств не десятки, а сотни и тысячи, и расползались они по соцсетям. Так, в частности, рухнули легенды об обстрелах российской армии, роддома и драмтеатра в Мариуполе. А потом еще и более двух с половиной тысяч националистов из батальона Азов, из которых уже успели сделать мучеников и Не просто банально сдались, но и вынуждены были отпустить Сотни заложников из числа мирных жителей, которые рассказали правду о том, что с ними творили. Да еще и подкачала украинская омбудсмен Денисова, переборщившая с описанием и смакованием якобы Описания, которых вслед за ней, охотно использовали наши западные коллеги, в том числе в этом зале. Уволенная, она была вынуждена признать, что сознательно врала для того, чтобы Украине продолжали давать оружие. И выяснилось, что никаких доказательств, помимо денисовского вранья, у украинцев и западных стран в общем нет. 
К этому всему надо добавить видеосвидетельство из освобожденных яростно обстреливаемых городов Донбасса, а также из освобожденных городов, где люди в открытую говорили, что если они кого и опасаются и винят за происходящее, то только украинскую армию и западные страны, давшие ей дальнобойное оружие, добивающие туда, куда раньше украинская артиллерия не доставала. Да еще и военные неудачи вызванные в том числе бездарными действиями Moreover, и предательством украинского бросающего почти безоружных солдат, в том числе новобранцев, на произвол не дающие им сдаться и сохранить свои жизни, поскольку сделать это или отступить, мешают заградоотряды из националистов, стреляющих в спину своим. Подобных видеороликов от украинских военных в последнее время стало слишком много. Да издаются они сотнями, если не тысячами. Скрывать это все от украинской и мировой общественности становилось все сложнее и сложнее. В новом котле в северодонецкие и мессианские окрестностях оказались тысячи солдат. А на носу саммит НАТО, на котором опять-таки будет обсуждаться вопрос о новых поставках оружия для Украины. А его можно не только использовать, но и продавать на сторону. По привычной для украинских чиновников схеме, списав все на военные потери. В общем, стало очевидно, что для того, чтобы вернуть внимание уставшей от Украины мировой общественности, нужна новая провокация а-ля Буча. Но проблема в том, что российская армия давно уже ниоткуда не уходила, а подбросить толпы или расстрелять мирных жителей имело бы смысл только на территории, вернувшихся под контроль киевского режима. И тогда, по всей видимости, возникла идея о провокации якобы нанесенном ударе по торговому центру В реальности никакого удара по нему не наносилось. Российские вооруженные силы нанесли удар высокоточным оружием по ангарам, поступившим от США и европейских стран вооружением и боеприпасами западного производства в районе Кременчугского завода дорожных машин. Это оружие и боеприпасы были рассредоточены по складской территории для дальнейшей отправки украинской группировки войск на Донбассе. То есть для того, чтобы из этого оружия обстреливали жилые районы Донецка, Луганска и других городов. Удары российских вооруженных сил позволили это предотвратить. Поставляемая Западом дальнобойная артиллерия дает высокую возможность дотянуться до тыловых районов Донбасса и ударить без всякой военной логики исключительно в целях мести и устрашения по мирным жителям. 15 июня такие удары были нанесены в СУ с применением полученных от стран НАТО 150-мм гаубиц «Цезарь», в результате чего погибли 6 мирных жителей и более 30 получили ранения. Каждую неделю к этой жуткой статистике прибавляются еще десятки убитых и раненых. Вчера в СУ впервые применили полученные из США СЗО М-142 «Хаймарс» по городу Перевальс в Луганской Народной Республике. Упоминаний об этих ударах против гражданских объектов и мирного населения на Донбассе, мы сегодня ни от западных, ни от украинских коллег не услышали. Вам нет до этого дела, как не было дела все 8 лет, пока украинская армия методично уничтожала жителей Донецкой и Луганской народных республик. Возвращаясь к Кременчугу, находящийся в отдалении торговый центр Амстор Удары не затронули. Это видно на видео с камер наблюдения. Попадание ракеты по торговому центру не оставило бы от него ничего. Но на видео украинских же блогеров видно, что от взрывной волны не пострадали, находящиеся внутри торгового центра товаров. Они стоят на своих местах и даже не повали. Не пострадали и соседние с торговым центром дома. У них даже стекла в окнах не выбило. Это возможно только если ракета взорвалась на значительном расстоянии. Однако детонация, хранившаяся на складской территории боеприпасов к западному оружию, вызвала пожар, который затем перекинулся на торговый центр. Уважаемые наши западные коллеги, 
our dear Western colleagues. Я столь подробно изложил здесь особенности работы украинских пропагандистов в расчете на то, что до вас наконец дойдет, как нелепо и неубедительно выглядите вы, подхватывая и продвигая новые продукты украинского агитпропа. Пропаганда. Среди них не только упомянутые мною фейки и инсценировки, но и утверждения о том, что Россия якобы препятствует вывозу украинского зерна. От вас в Киеве хотят лишь поддержки деньгами и оружием. При этом вы должны понимать, что поставки последнего, как мы вас с самого начала и предупреждали, были и остаются для нас военными целями, как и наемники из ваших государств. Just like mercenaries from your states. И объекты, где это оружие и наемники размещаются или складируются, также становятся законными военными целями, как и были таковыми ангары на территории Кременчугского завода дорожных машин. Киевский режим целенаправленно складирует вооружение в самом центре городов, по соседству с жилыми районами, подвергая опасности населения и превращая ее в живой щит. А вы пытаетесь этого не замечать. And you try not to notice this. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly attempt to promote. Devaluing the values that you allegedly от вашего нежелания признавать это, правда, но и не становится. В завершение хотел бы еще раз подчеркнуть, что поставками вооружений вы лишь продлеваете агонию преступного киевского режима, готового привнести в жертву свое население. И чем раньше вы это осознаете, тем раньше украинское руководство сядет за стол переговоров с реалистичной позицией, а не с лозунгами и фантомными болями. Мы начали специальную военную операцию с тем, чтобы прекратить обстрел Донбасса Украины. To stop the shelling of the Donbas by Ukraine, and so that the territory of this country, which has been turned into anti-Russia, the behest of a number of Western countries, as well as its nationalist leadership, ceases to pose a threat to Russia or the inhabitants of the south and south east of Ukraine. And until those goals are achieved, our operation will continue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by thanking uh, Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for briefing on the situation in Ukraine. We acknowledge the participation and remarks of uh, President of Ukraine in today's briefing. India remains deeply concerned over the situation in Ukraine. The conflict has resulted in loss of lives and countless miseries for its peoples, particularly for women, children, and elderly, with millions becoming homeless and forced to take shelter in neighboring countries. From the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine, India has been consistently calling for complete cessation of hostilities and advocated the path of peace, dialogue, and diplomacy. We support all efforts to alleviate the suffering of the people of Ukraine, especially talks between Ukraine and the Russian Federation. India has also has been sending uh, humanitarian supplies to Ukraine and its neighbors, which include medicines and other essential relief material. Reports of deaths of civilians in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict are deeply disturbing, and in this regard, we express our grave concern. In recent years, critical civilian infrastructure in urban areas have become easy targets in situations of armed conflict. The issue of the protection of civilian objects in armed conflict should be considered within the framework of applicable international law. Earlier, India had unequivocally condemned the killings of civilians in Busha and supported the call for an independent investigation. Mr. President, the impact of the Ukraine conflict is not just limited to Europe. 
the conflict is exacerbating concerns over food, fertilizer, fuel security, particularly in the developing countries. It is necessary for all of us to adequately appreciate the importance of equity, affordability and accessibility when it comes to food grants. Open markets must not become an argument to perpetuate inequity and promote discrimination. India is committed to work constructively in mitigating the adverse impact of the conflict on food security. We have welcomed the recommendation of the Global Crisis Response Group Task Team to exempt purchases of food by WFP for humanitarian assistance from food export restrictions. India has been providing financial assistance as well as supplying food grains to countries which are impacted by the Ukraine conflict. India has exported 1.8 million tons of wheat to countries in need, including to Afghanistan, Myanmar, Sudan and Yemen in the last two months. We are also helping our neighbor Sri Lanka to ensure their food security. We are trying to increase the production of fertilizers in India. There is also a need to focus on the availability of fertilizers and keep the supply chains of fertilizers smooth at a global scale. Similarly, efforts should be made to ensure stability in the global supply of fuel commensurate with the demand. We reiterate that the importance of uh, UN, UN guiding principles of humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian action must always be guided by the principles of humanitarian assistance, that is humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. These measures should never be politicized. Let me conclude, Mr. President, by reaffirming that the contemporary global order has been built on the UN Charter, international law, and respect for sovereignty and the territorial integrity of the states. I thank you. I thank the representative of India for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of China. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the military conflict in Ukraine is already over four months long. On this geopolitical crisis, great concern to the international community, China has always made its independent assessments based on the historical context and the merits of the Ukrainian issue. Chinese leaders repeatedly noted the necessity to respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries to adhere to the purposes and the principles of the UN Charter to heed the legitimate security concerns of all countries and to support all those efforts that are conducive to the peaceful settlement of the crisis. For some time now, China has joined all peace-loving countries in calling for a ceasefire. We have been keenly committed to promoting peace talks and made unremitting efforts for de-escalating the situation, early restoration of peace, and mitigating humanitarian situation and stabilizing the global economic order. It is regrettable and worrying that the conflict continues. The crisis is trending in a protracted and expanded direction. Humanitarian situation remains dire. Civilian casualties are growing, and people are suffering. Multifaceted spillover effects are exacerbating global challenges. We stress again that dialogue and negotiation is the only viable way to restore and consolidate peace, and ending hostility soon is a keen aspiration of the international community. China supports direct negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. We also welcome Secretary General's good offices on the issue of the grain export, among others. Mr. President, peace is for all to strive for and to defend. All members of the international community should responsibly work for a proper resolution of the crisis and avoid contrary actions.
All parties should work in concert to create the necessary environment and conditions for peace talks by the parties. Facts have fully borne out that sending weapons cannot bring about peace, nor can sanctions and pressurization solve the security conundrum. Attempts to weaponize the world economy and to coerce other countries into taking sides will artificially divide the international community and make the world even less secure. Delaying and obstructing diplomatic negotiations for geopolitical purposes or even adding fuel to the fire to intensify confrontation will only magnify the conflict and inevitably end up in hurting oneself. Mr. President, this Ukrainian crisis has once again sounded alarm for the world. Security is indivisible. A blind faith in the position of strength and expansion of military alliances and the pursuit of one's own security at the expense of other countries' security will inevitably lead to security developments. NATO's five eastward expansions of the Cold War have not only failed to make Europe secure, but also sow the seeds of conflict. It is a lesson that is worth some good reflecting on. The Cold War ended a long time ago. It is necessary for NATO to reconsider its own positioning and its responsibilities. Completely abandon the Cold War mentality that is based on block confrontation and strive to build a balanced, effective, and sustainable European security framework in line with the principle of indivisible security. Like all peace-loving countries and peoples in the world, China pays close attention to NATO's strategic adjustment and is deeply concerned about the, the policy implication of the so-called strategic concept. Certain NATO leaders lately painted other countries as a threat. But the fact is it is NATO itself that has made troubles in different parts of the world. We urge NATO to learn its lessons and not to use this crisis in Ukraine as an excuse to stoke worldwide block confrontation or a new Cold War. And not to look for imaginary enemies in the Asia Pacific or artificially create contradictions and divisions. We firmly oppose certain elements clamoring for NATO's involvement in Asia Pacific or an Asia Pacific version of NATO on the back of military advances, a long outdated Cold War script must never be reenacted in Asia Pacific. The kind of turmoil and conflict that is affecting parts of the world must not be allowed to happen in Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific countries share an appreciation for the hard won peace and prosperity and a wish to focus on mutually beneficial cooperation in pursuit of common development and revitalization. Any attempt to go against the tide of history is doomed to fail. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for their statement, and I give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Mr. President, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Rosemary De Carlo for her detailed briefing. We acknowledge President Zelensky's address to the Council and his first-hand account of the latest developments in Ukraine. We meet today following concerning reports of intensified missile strikes across Ukraine in urban areas, including Kiev and Kharkiv. In particular, the images in Kremenchuk of a shopping mall, something familiar to all of us in our everyday life, engulfed in flames, are horrifying. This incident has added to the war's immensely high human toll and should be properly investigated. Incidents like these are a clear demonstration of why civilian objects are protected under international law. The UAE reiterates its unequivocal condemnation of attacks on civilians and civilian objects and infrastructure. 
With the conflict now entering its fifth month, women and children and the elderly are disproportionately impacted. More than half of Ukraine's children are now displaced from home, and women, children and the elderly are suffering from ongoing violence and trauma and seeking refuge in neighboring countries. It is well past time that we find parameters for ceasefire negotiations as a starting point to end this war. If the conflict continues unabated, we can expect the tsunami of global ramifications to worsen. People around the world are already suffering, both directly and from the conflict's wider repercussions, including distorted global trade, the effects of sanctions, and increased food prices, threatening a global recession. The most vulnerable, as always, are the worst affected. In this context, I would like to make the following points. First, the application of international humanitarian law is fundamental to preserving human life. Compliance is both a moral and a legal obligation, and we reiterate the importance of respecting the principles of necessity, distinction, and proportionality that are paramount in conflict, as well as the importance of ensuring accountability. Any military operation must be limited to exclusively military objectives and all precautionary measures must be taken to avoid the direct or indirect targeting of civilians. The fact that the war in Ukraine has so greatly affected heavily urbanized areas with high density civilian populations only underlines the imperative of applying the principles outlined in the Council's framework on the protection of civilians and civilian objects. Second, the international community should intensify efforts to de-escalate and engage proactively to end this conflict. Almost two months have passed since this council adopted a presidential statement expressing deep concern regarding the maintenance of international peace and security in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine, however, has continued to escalate. The UN Charter outlines many of the tools that can be deployed to reach a peaceful settlement, but knowing that the tools exist or that they are at the disposal of the parties is not enough. The talk needs to be walked and now is the time to have an actual dialogue on the humanitarian challenges and to prioritize an immediate cessation of hostilities, laying out the contours of a sustainable solution that ends this conflict and ends it on a foundation upon which peace can be built. We encourage the parties to seize this opportunity and we urge the Secretary General and others in trying to bring together the parties for good faith negotiations to this end. Third, Helping ease global food insecurity must be a priority. This cannot wait. We must avoid a food catastrophe. We are already facing what David Beasley so vividly described as having to take food from the hungry to feed the starving. Specifically, there needs to be a solution to export the grain and fertilizer that are so critical to food systems around the world. We are encouraged by ongoing efforts aimed at allowing ships safe passage to and from key seaports, including Odessa. The Security Council must do everything within its power to support these negotiations, and we look forward to the Council addressing this in more detail. Finally, Mr. President, the devastation in Ukraine from this war is undeniable. We risk a lost generation of children denied education and opportunity. We need to redouble our efforts to achieve peace and end this human suffering. This Council must exhaust all avenues and spare no efforts to this objective. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the UAE for their statement, and I give the floor to representative of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. Je remercie la secrétaire générale adjointe, Madame Rose-Marie Carlo, for her briefing. I thank Secretary General Ms. Romain de Carlo for her briefing. Je salue la participation I welcome the virtual Président participation of President Zelensky in this Monsieur meeting. Président, Mr. President, la guerre en Ukraine dure à présent depuis the war in Ukraine plus de quatre mois. has now been going on for more than four months, de and au plan its consequences continue to spread Alors que on the humanitarian and security level as the political and diplomatic horizon appears to be receding and shrinking to nothing. The serious humanitarian crisis resulting from the war must absolutely be stemmed. Too many civilians have paid with their lives and Millions of them, many women and children, have been forced to flee combat areas, to seek refuge in other cities 
country or abroad. Despite the outpouring of international solidarity to host Ukrainian refugees, and despite the commitment of the UN at its specialized agency to host Ukrainian refugees, and despite the commitment of the UN at its specialized agency to assist them, the humanitarian situation in Ukraine is worsening with the bombardments, the destruction of production and distribution facilities, and the disruption of value chains. Outside Ukraine, the consequences of the war are exacerbating food insecurity in countries already in conflict. In some regions, the specter of famine looms as a likely prospect as aid workers struggle to provide urgently needed food aid. De nombreux pays font face à une At the same time, many countries are facing unprecedented economic inflation, which is straining their economies. This gloomy picture is, however, not inevitable. It is urgent for this crisis to be brought under control and for its upper effects to be rapidly contained. There is still time to avoid chaos. The parties to the conflict must find a consensus regarding the export of the tons of wheat that are being held up in Ukrainian ports. In this regard, we welcome the actions taken by the African Union, and we hope that they will soon yield results within a reasonable time frame. Many farmers, especially in Africa, are waiting for fertilizers for their crops, for those of them who are already facing significant climate challenges. This situation creates uncertainty that could threaten agricultural production. Mr. President, we are concerned about the signals we are seeing which suggest a clear desire to prolong the war. We repeat, the world does not need another protracted conflict. That said, this, the war is not a state of lawlessness. The parties to the conflict must respect their commitments under international humanitarian law, refrain from any use of weapons of mass destruction, and do everything possible to facilitate unimpeded and secure access for humanitarian aid. Civilians and civilian infrastructure must not be targeted. We condemn the artillery fire targeting a shopping center in central Ukraine yesterday. The tendency to trivialize the threat of the use of weapons of mass destruction is a matter of concern for my country. As a party to the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons and the Biological Weapons Convention, we condemn any use or threat of use of weapons with indiscriminate effects. The very existence of such weapons poses a real threat to our shared Monsieur peace and security. Mon pays Mr. President, my country continues to believe that the best way to end the humanitarian crisis and, and the outbreak of violence in Ukraine is to end the conflict. We remain convinced that the international community has the means to bring the parties to the discussion table. We urge the parties to engage in good faith in constructive negotiations to leverage all the diplomatic and political challenges to leverage all the diplomatic and political challenges to leverage all the diplomatic and political challenge, channels in order to find a negotiated and consensual solution to the conflict. Peace and security must remain the ultimate objective towards which the initiatives of all the parties and of the international community converge. We call for the cessation of hostilities with a view to returning to peaceful coexistence. Thank you. I thank the representative of Gabon for her statement. Give the floor to the representative of Norway. Thank you, President. I thank you, USG Di Carlo, for shedding further light on the situation in Ukraine and the continued attacks against civilians by Russian forces. I welcome also the strong testimony of President Zelensky on behalf of the people of Ukraine. First, <clears throat> Norway reiterates that Russia's war is, in and of itself, a violation of international law. The principles of the UN Charter are clear on the illegality of the acquisition of territory by force. We reiterate our call for Russia to stop its illegal attack on Ukraine immediately. Second, 
Norway strongly condemns all violations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. We condemn in the strongest term the reported killings of Ukrainian civilians, and we call on Russia to immediately end these indiscriminate and deliberate attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. The targeting of residential areas, such as the devastating missile attack against a shopping center in Kremlchuk yesterday, is unacceptable. The urban warfare and intensified Russian missile attacks against Kyiv, Kharkiv and other cities is causing immense civilian suffering. We reiterate our demand and the demand of international law that the civilian population must be protected and that all necessary measures be taken to avoid civilian casualties. International humanitarian law must be fully respected and implemented. We condemn Belarus for facilitating Russia's attack on Ukraine. Third, violation of international law cannot go unchallenged. All violation needs to be investigated and perpetrators of any crimes must be brought to justice. We support the investigation by the ICC, the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine and other international investigations. President, as the war in Ukraine continues, it is inflicting a terrible cumulative harm on the civilian population, undermining prospects for peace and security. The protection of civilians and human rights is a prerequisite for sustainable peace after conflict. In Ukraine, the best way to protect civilians is clear. It is for Russia to end this war. Thank you. I thank the representative of Norway for their statement. The representative of the United Kingdom has asked for the floor to make a further statement and I give them the floor. Thank you, President. Uh, I don't want to take too much more time, but I wanted to say that the Russian representative can try to claim that nothing is true and make outrageous claims of Ukrainian provocations. Cover-ups are as old as crime itself. But the undeniable fact is that Russian forces are in Ukraine and there are no Ukrainian forces in Russia. There is one aggressor here. The evidence will catch up with them and there will be accountability for these crimes. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom uh, for their statement. The representative of the Russian Federation has asked for the floor to make a further statement and I give them the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I will also be brief. I won't take too much of your time. I just wanted to note that such statements sound very convincing coming from a representative of a country that brought the world such provocations as the Skripal case or the Litvinenko case, as well as many other incidents that will go down in the history books as glaring provocations and false flag operations. Please keep that in mind next time you try to teach us lessons. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for this further statement, and I give the floor now to representative of Estonia. Mr. President, I speak on behalf of the Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania and my own country, Estonia. I thank the Albanian Presidency for organising uh, this briefing and Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for the updates on Russia's full-scale barbaric military aggression against an independent and sovereign country that wishes nothing more than living in peace and freedom to choose their own destiny free from foreign interference in its internal affairs. We warmly welcome President Zelensky's participation in this meeting and commend him and the Ukrainian people for their heroic courage and resistance for the freedom of their country and for the freedom of us all. 
crime against aggression is a prime crime against the international law. Putin's regime has unleashed a colonial, neo-imperialist, expansionist war against Ukraine, amplified by the obscene, dehumanizing disinformation campaign against Ukraine and the identity, language, history, and the right to exist of Ukrainian people. The Security Council must urgently perform its duties to stop this unfolding catastrophe. As we have seen over the course of four months, 124 days now, unable to defeat the defenders of Ukraine in the battlefield, Russia's military seeks to achieve its aims by terrorizing civilians. We have already seen this too many times. Maternity hospitals, schools, kindergartens, residential buildings, and now also shopping centers are targeted indiscriminately and without any remorse. Russia's terror knows no bounds. The shelling of a crowded shopping center in Kremenchuk, as well as numerous other intensi intensified attacks on Ukrainian cities, Solvyansk, Kharkiv, Kiev, in recent days had no military justification whatsoever. No justification other than to kill, injure, and cause extensive human suffering, and thereby hope that the spirit of Ukrainian people will be broken, the calls for peace at all costs will grow, and that the demands of the aggressor will subsequently be met. This is the diplomacy Russian way, by using terror and blackmail. The Russian actions represent flagrant violations of international law, including the United Nations Charter. Russia has repeatedly ignored the calls by the UN General Assembly, as well as the other as well as the order of the International Court of Justice to immediately suspend the military operations in its territory of Ukraine and with, withdraw its armed forces from Ukraine. The borders of a country are not to be changed by force. This demand is the heart and soul of the UN Charter. The systemic violations of humanitarian law and human rights, deliberate attacks on civilian objects and civilians, executions, sexual and gender-based violence, arbitrary arrests, abductions, enforced disappearances, and forced deportations of civilians, including unaccompanied children to Russia, as well as their illegal adoption committed against Ukrainian people, amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity, and possibly even genocide. The international community should not spare any effort to ensure that those responsible for these atrocious crimes are held to account. We need collectively to give our strongest support to the ongoing work by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, the Independent International Commission of Inquiry, mandated by the United Nations Human Rights Council, and the work of the expert mission under the Mo Moscow mechanism of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, as well as the national investigation by the Office of Prosecutor General of Ukraine. Justice will be brought to the victims and their families. Mr. President, we are concerned that yet again has Russia resorted to dangerous and irresponsible nuclear rhetoric by announcing its intention to transfer nuclear capable missiles to Belarus and upgrading Belarus warplanes to make them capable of carrying nuclear weapons. We urge Russia and Belarus to act in line with their international commitments and cease destabilizing nuclear subrattling. Any use of weapons of mass destruction is unacceptable and leads to severe consequences. We her herewith strongly condemn the involvement of Belarus as Russia's complicity in this aggression against Ukraine. We also strongly condemn Russia's weaponizing food to increase food shortage and global hunger and thus destabilize international security. Recent reports have shown that Russian forces have been systemic, systematically stealing grain and other products from local farmers in occupied areas of Ukraine. As a result of Russia's military activity, more than 20 million tons of grain is currently blocked in Ukraine. We fully support the efforts of the United Nations to find an urgently needed solution for the export of Ukraine's grain and urge Russia to ensure free passage of shipping from Ukrainian ports. Mr. President, 
Let me reiterate that it is the obligation of each member of the international community to stand up against those who violate the principles and rules of international law, including the UN Charter. Otherwise, we risk losing the international rules-based order we built and committed to since the end of the World War II. Fundamental principles of respecting sovereignty, territorial integrity and refraining from the use of force are to be respected by every country and are not for debate. We resolutely condemn Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. We urge once again Russia to immediately stop its indiscriminate attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure and to immediately and unconditionally withdraw all its troops and military equipment from the entire territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania stand with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Thank you. I thank the representative of Estonia for their statement and I give the floor to the representative of Poland. Mr. President, thank you for convening this important meeting. I also take this opportunity to thank USG Di Carlo for her briefing, as well as His Excellency President Zelensky for his powerful statement. Mr. President, irrespectively of what we have heard again from the Russian representative today, Russia is waging a total war against Ukraine. A total war which from its very beginning, 124 days ago, has been in total lack of respect for the international humanitarian law and human rights law. We have a duty to repeat it over and over again, even though the aggressors themselves keep reminding us about the true character of their actions with every atrocity they commit. Yesterday's deadly rocket attack launched by Russian forces on a bustling shopping center in Kremenchuk was just the latest in the long list of those somber reminders. As the heart-wrenching images are still before our eyes, we need to be loud and clear. In only the past four days, Russia has fired over 130 missiles on Ukrainian cities of Kiev, Kharkiv, Mykolaiv and Odessa, to name just a few. By deciding to hit objects of no military significance, Moscow wants to cause large human losses, terrorize the civilian population, and disrupt the functioning of infrastructure catering to everyday needs of ordinary Ukrainians. According to cautious estimates provided by the OHCHR, only between June 23rd and June 26th, more than 120 civilian casualties were confirmed. The shelling of the Amster Mall in Kremenchuk alone killed at least 20 people and injured 60 more. Moscow is not only disregarding humanitarian issues and ignoring international criticism, it wants to show that it will strive to break the resistance of the Ukrainian authorities by all means and costs. Mr. President, with respect to the important topic we are discussing, Russia continues to disrespect this Council and the UN Charter. It is particularly cynical that Russia, a permanent member of the Security Council, which has been entrusted with the responsibility for maintenance of international peace and security, is not only failing to fulfill its basic responsibilities, but acts as an aggressor in blatant disregard for this organization and the foundational rules the international peace and security mechanisms have been built on. It is our duty to work together to collect and preserve the evidence of all violations of human rights and international humanitarian law that have taken place in Ukraine. Poland's position in this regard is clear. All those responsible, directly and indirectly, for committing war crimes in Ukraine should be brought to justice. Apart from seeking justice, Ukraine has a full right to defend itself and expect the international community to provide necessary assistance in this regard. Humanitarian, military and financial aid allows Ukrainians to protect their citizens, secure their basic needs and ensure post-war recovery. For 124 days now, 
Ukrainians have been bravely putting resistance to the aggressor's forces, which continue to strive for a territorial grab, which might actually never satisfy their appetite for more. The responsibility for the Russian actions lies also with Belarus, which, since the 24th of February, has been actively facilitating Moscow's military action by making its airspace, territory, and infrastructure available to Russian troops. If not for Minsk's support, Russia's aggression would have been limited. Belarusian leadership should be considered complicit of crimes committed by Russia in Ukraine. Mr. President, once more, we urge the Russian Federation to stop the war and to fully withdraw all its forces from the territory of Ukraine. This is the only way to prevent further deaths of civilians. We also urge Russia to fully respect the sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity of Ukraine, as well as international humanitarian law and human rights law in particular. I thank you. I thank the representative of Poland for their statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. This meeting is adjourned.